Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I'm here with my co-host, Matt Scott. And yeah, what are we doing? I don't know what we're doing. Somebody <laughs> tell me. No, we're, uh, I, I, this is kind of cool. We're here with our friends, Justin and Kira from West by 1000. Um, contributors, longtime friends of Overland Journal. These guys kind of go everywhere on two wheels. And um, I think one of the things that we like so much about it is they actually kind of do it in an attainable way, which is really rad. They're not on the fanciest bikes. They're not on the biggest bikes. They kind of, you know, just get after it. They're always out exploring. So it's a really great thing to have you guys on. Thanks Thank for coming you. up. We yeah. really appreciate being invited. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And from my perspective, the quality of the content that you guys produce is world class. You guys have done several things for the magazine. Uh, Justin, your photography is totally enviable. The quality of work that you're doing. Um, Matt and I were just talking earlier today and some of your action sports stuff is is truly exceptional, world class right now. So you should be really proud of the thank you the work you're doing. And w another thing that's always been so aspiring to me is the fact that you guys have been able to kind of just take your own path. You've you've never just stuck yourself on like the influencer train or anything else. You've done what felt creatively inspiring to yourselves and allowed you guys to travel together and, and have all these amazing new experiences. So it seems like you've put those things first. So maybe talk about that a little bit. How do you guys make decisions about what you're going to do next? Oh, man. Or is it just a complete madhouse and you're going to give us some yeah, mumbo a lot jumbo? Of, I mean, a I lot mean, of it is, is, is sort of not saying no to things. Like yeah, when opportunities, when people come to us with an opportunity, we, we're, oh, unless there's a schedule conflict. We usually always say yes. Yeah. As long as it sounds cool. Well, and if it's on that, like, the long list of things we've wanted to see or do sort of thing, that's like, okay, we have a free few months. This is the right weather or the right time to go to Italy or, or go to Mongolia or, or something. I mean, you guys are such nomads. You're kind of everywhere, always. Yeah. It's been seven seven years, I think. Yeah. yeah. Since we've been, we've been pretty much on the road for, like, seven years. I mean, we... Homeless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have, you know, we have, our, you know, our things in one place now. Finally, we had a garage. That was it. I remember yeah. the garage. Yeah. Yes. It was a garage filled with moto gear. Yeah. Yeah. It was a really cool garage. <laughs> yeah. We got rid still of that garage and then we bought uh, garage doors for his mom's house and she lets us store our crap there. Yeah. <laughs> now. It, was a, it was a pretty good trade. It's much cheaper. Yeah. It was a pretty good trade instead of having a, like a storage garage full of junk. But so you guys bounce between Phoenix yeah. And then spend most of your time kind of these days in Ensenada, which is cool. I mean, what, what do you guys like so much about Ensenada? I mean, I, I love Baja. We all love Baja. Yeah. 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 I think everybody loves Baja. It's not scary. You should it go. Is, it's definitely yes. not scary. It's, uh, I mean, culturally, it's extremely developed and it's diverse. And people, I mean, if you want to meet passionate entrepreneurs and artists, there's a lot of them down there. And, and, Obviously, we have friends, and we have kind of a homestead to go back to, so it's really easy for us. But there's just so much on a, on a personal level, like with nature, with the people. Um, the good language barrier is not too hard. Like Good food. You know, have you guys picked up a little bit of Spanish? She speaks way I more try. Spanish than I do. I, I, I'm terrible at it. I stumble I through. I, I can understand it a lot better than I can speak it. She can speak it. Well, the problem is that it. everyone in Ensenada speaks, well, not just Ensenada, Baja, they speak English. And then they also, you know, don't have time for you to fumble through your <laughs> Can yeah, I they, swear? <laughs> just, we'll, we'll take care of okay. it. Don't worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, Subpar they, Spanish. M most people down there, you know, most people in Baja want to practice their English as much as you want to practice Interesting. Spanish. And sure. so you kind of bump into that a lot. Like, yeah. they're, they're, I mean, they're, yeah, it's, but, I mean, they're, you can get around fine. Everyone's really, they, they find it funny when you actually do try, and so they'll speak to you in English, so or in Spanish, so you can practice understanding. And they encourage you speak back to me in English. You can have like a little language trade. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. That's that's something that's like yeah, super high on my list when I actually have. Well, I need to just make the time. Um, yeah. Yeah. You absolutely. know, there's so many wonderful Spanish-speaking countries around the world that I really need to need to prioritize that. I mean, like you said, all of them. Typically, when you're down there, yeah. they, they speak English, so it, maybe it's the courtesy I need to do back. Yeah, we have we, we have good friends down there. That's another. I mean, we have a, a number of very good friends down there, and that draws us back down. When when COVID, she was talking about this earlier. When COVID hit, we we were in Sonora 
the Sonora rally had just wrapped up and everybody was bailing and going back to the States. And we just turned and went West and yeah. went, went to Ensenada and we were there all the way through the end of June. Um, wow. Yeah. I think actually we made one trek up and then back down. Yeah. We went, I think we went yeah. up to grab some stuff and then turned around and went back to Ensenada and just stayed all the way through the end of June. And, um, the, the place that we stay is called Granada Cove. It's a little, okay. little cove on the, on the, on the sea. And we called it Granada COVID. And <laughs> because everybody was kind of stuck there, like we, yeah. and we actually ran out of water Memorial day week and we Towards ran out of water end. for like two weeks. Interesting. The whole city of Ensenada, there was a fire at the water treatment plant north of town. Oh man. So yeah. for two weeks we had no water and we had, uh, Mauricio's got this hot tub. Which we, luckily we had filled because yeah. for years it was just empty. Yeah. <laughs> and we, and we were in it a lot. Well, we, <laughs> we had another friend of ours, Joel is traveling in a solar powered van and he had made it as far as central Baja and then broke long down. story broke down, came back to Ensenada and we were using the solar powered van to heat the hot tub. <laughs> and so we were, during COVID we were just hanging out in this hot yeah, tub. And then we run, we had a projector and we usually run movies off the van. So we parked the van in front of the hot tub. <laughs> it was a really tough time for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but we, when we ran out of water, we used the hot tub water for the toilets and, and to take the neighbors showers. also would come and grab some cause, uh, our friends Mauricio and Abby, they have a lot more than maybe some of the people around them, so they were pretty generous with their resources. That's cool. That's why yeah. should be. It seems that culture is very much that way. Yeah. 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 Um, the one, one of the few times I've hitchhiked in my life was in Mexico, and I just remember being so nervous being in a de different country. One of my first trips, I was in the middle of Copper Canyon and got totally la lost on a hiking trail and like just stuck my thumb out in the middle of Mexico. And, of course, the people were totally wonderful. Oh, yeah. yeah. And like, and some of them spoke English a little bit and they were like making sure that I was okay and yeah. like went out of their way. I mean, so every experience just about that I've had in Mexico has just been so wonderful. Yeah. They're just, it's a great culture down there. And I, I think that for me, one of the questions that a couple of the questions that I wanted to ask, but one comes to mind fairly early around the conversation that we just had with where you guys live and how you live your life. What has living that way taught you? What has, how has that really changed your perspective as travelers, but also like as humans, since you have kind of stripped away a lot of the traditional ways of living? You, you don't go to a nine to five. You don't go to the same home. You don't drive the least sedan. Yeah. You guys have completely changed all of those things um, in your life. And, and, and how has that really changed you? How has that really affected you? Well, I think, I think you, I mean, you really nailed it with the, the stripping away part, especially for me, I, I realized you don't need very much stuff. You need way less stuff than you actually, than you have currently and a lot less than you think you need. I right. mean, I, I, I travel with a backpack full of camera gear and a, and a duffel bag with clothes and that's it. Yeah. That's all, and that's all I need. If I'm riding a motorcycle, you can add, you know, a camping. helmet and riding gear and some camping stuff. And then, you know, you're pretty well set. I mean, I think I think stripping it away and, and realizing I mean, when we first started really traveling together, uh, like on a permanent basis, um, we, we, we ended up living in Japan for a while and which we want to talk about later. Yeah. 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 We'll that's, get back to it. Yeah. I mean it, it, but you know, traveling there and then just bouncing around to other places to work and do things, you have to keep it small and you know, you can't take all that stuff with you. So I mean, I whatever you can carry sort of thing. And if yeah. you don't want to carry a, a lot of weight, which I don't. So yeah. you just figure out how to yeah. wear the same. I, I think traveling things. keeps your mind busy and it yeah. makes you realize that it's, you know, living in the moment is actually the most fulfilling thing you can do. I always, I don't know, personally, I always kind of go between this thing of when I'm traveling, I'm like super happy. And I, and, and I don't know how else to say, but I forget about Amazon. I forget about that thing that I want. Yeah, I forget about stuff. the, yeah. the upgrade that I want to do to my, my bike or my car or whatever. And I'm just like living in the moment. And I think when you, when you're able to reach that point, you know, you realize I don't actually need that stuff. And you, oh, yeah. you appreciate quality more as well. Yeah. Like ha having good, I mean, if, if you're only going to have, a you know, few a few things, if you're only going to have one duffel bag. Yeah. It better be one that you, you like, and you're going to keep using it. And it's going to survive. Like that's a big, that's always, that's been a big part of our, yeah, that's our definitely lifestyle. been introduced to my lifestyle since yeah. we started traveling more. It's just, uh, quality over quantity, not having to worry about the durability of my gear when I, we're out in the middle of nowhere. And like 
I don't know. It's it's nice on a mental level to just kind of strip that stuff away and uh, focus on like the people that you meet and the landscapes that you experience and kind of the tasks at hand. Yeah. It's just and, so much and, less stuff to worry about. And Kira, how, how have you found that seven years of living like that has changed you as a person? How is that? How are you a different Kira today than seven years ago? I mean, <laughs> I'm definitely, I would say that, you know, the minimalism, obviously now that we have a little bit more of um, kind of a homestead in Arizona and Ensenada, I have more stuff than I had earlier on in the travels. Um, but I definitely am more thorough and thoughtful about my choices uh, in everything. And I care more about the relationships that I have. I don't have time for a lot of them, so they have to be really, really um, worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, you know, just and you guys as travelers also probably know it's like it's not easy to just maintain a thousand Facebook friendships and, and be really quality um, because I I can hardly call my best friend from high school, you know, all the time. So. And then you're constantly meeting new people, yeah. right? I think that's one of the, yeah, the fun things of traveling, at least for me. And I think most travelers is those connections and those things that you meet on the road. And, and I feel you with like the, the, the friends from high school, like, like I feel bad. Like I love, I love a lot of those people dearly. Um, but when you're just constantly going and going and going, it almost just continues to separate your life from that of a normal one. Yeah, right. we have very. And it makes it harder to. It makes it so and hard to does, relate. Does that make it difficult to, to relate back to those older relationships? Because now they're maybe they are doing the more of the suburban, path, which is not a bad thing. So, no, no, you know, no. It, it's a, it can be a beautiful thing in many ways too. So, are you finding that your your relationships are also changing because you need to relate more to the people that you're with? Yes, I mean, well, when it comes to the very few people that I do keep in contact with from, you know, past life sort of thing. Yes, there's a, a huge divide, I think, in what we do. But as long as you're genuinely interested in that person, it gives me, you know, my time to listen to them and get to know what their life is about and hear their, their trials and tribulations. And if they want to hear about mine, they can hear about it. We talk about it a lot because we're obscure, so people ask about it a lot. Yeah, sure. And you know, I kind of get tired of talking about what I'm doing. So it's nice to actually hear what your friends are doing for like two hours. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. The, the other side, right? The grass. Yeah. The other side. Yeah. How, my, my how about you? The grass is not greener on the other side. We have really good lives. Trust me. I know. I love it. Yeah. I'm not going to complain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a lot of, um, I don't have a lot of old friendships that I maintain. I, my best friend is up in Seattle and, um, he's, he's doing, He's doing very well, especially considering where we all came from and the lifestyle that he's living is pretty normal. You know, he's got a normal job. He's got a he's got a lady, bought a house, yeah. no kids yet, but um, but it's what he wanted. It was like he reached his goals, and so yeah, you know, he's happy with that. He actually came down and saw us um, oh. Memorial Day weekend in Mexico. Yeah, we we exactly. had to we had to sneak him in to Ensenada because <laughs> they had the military had closed off the the highway. Sure, and uh, we went over the border, picked him up in San Diego, came back over the border. And coming into Ensenada, they wouldn't let us in. And all of our stuff was there, you know, our car, everything. So we had to take some back roads to the, sure. to the yeah. Valle to get them in. But, um, you know, but he's, you know, the, he's willing to do that. He's willing to jump on a plane, fly down to San Diego and sneak into Mexico to hang out with me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, we don't have anything in common in the general sense anymore. I mean, he. Yeah, you just care about each other. Yeah, stuff. I mean, yeah. he likes, you know, he likes fishing and barbecuing and watching football on Sunday and. That's, but that's sometimes his, that's really nice. Yeah. Oh I, I mean, I, I talk about that all the time. I'd love to just like sit at home and eat a pack of Oreos and do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think I think one of the interesting things with COVID is so many travelers have been able to try out that normal nine to five life. Like I found yeah. myself like, like, ooh, I, I want to watch football on Sunday. Yeah. That yeah. sounds that sounds great. They have those, those triumphant horn music and it's really, it's like, a, it's like an event. But um, oh, man, like, so true. You, you guys yeah, have so been true. able to kind of keep it going. Like I feel like one of the things that I, that I really respect about you is you found a way to kind of ethically and sustainably still explore and live a life of adventure, I guess, during COVID. Yeah. I mean, um, you guys were just in Saudi Arabia yeah. for the Dakar rally. Yeah. Um, and then last year you guys were in 
Peru. Peru, Peru for Dakar, 2019. Yeah, yeah. End of 2019. Okay, so, yeah, so exactly. two years ago. Yeah. I always get Dakar confused because it starts like January 1st. January 1st, January 1st yeah, and it'll yeah, be exactly. Dakar 2021 because it is 2021. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. my mind hasn't switched <laughs> years yet. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. us too because we get there before the new year. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, right, the new year wherever we're at. So it's like yeah, this year we, we flew out weird. on Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah we flew yeah. out Christmas Day to Saudi. Um, well, to du- like a, we, we got quarantined in Dubai for a day. Sort and then, of. It and then wasn't ended overnight. Up, it wasn't really Yeah, and then quarantine. ended up in Riyadh for... Uh, no, or not, Jeddah. Jeddah for, for like, 48 we had to, hours. Yeah, quarantined for two days in Jeddah. Yeah. And like five... I think we took four COVID tests before we could even start the Dakar. And then one on the way home. Yeah, yeah we took... We took, yeah, like three COVID tests before getting on the flight from well, LA. Well, because we then... didn't get the results back. So we had we went to one, wouldn't get the results back in time. So we went to another one. They wouldn't get it back in time. So we went to another one, like a mile down yeah. the street from the Airport. LAX. Yeah. And then took a cab back. And we had like 15 minutes before they wouldn't let us board. Wow. Yeah, yeah. we got really lucky. I mean, everybody getting getting to the Dakar is a It own. was a nightmare. I mean, the, a, the ASO makes, like, I'm, I'm convinced that they... They set that up. Like they make everything difficult for you. Like yeah. the entire process of getting to Dakar. Well, the safer is that they get as a whole, the more annoying that you have to make it because there has to be some challenge left. So they're like, okay, well, we have the safety regulations. So instead, we're going to make you walk, uh, walk two miles to go to the bathroom and then another two miles to find food and then not tell you how to navigate through things. Yeah, this this year the bivouac was a little more condensed than like in Peru. It was it was like a like a jungle. I mean, it would you'd get lost. This year, they they set it up the same every day, so you knew exactly where things were. It was oh, that's much, smart. It was, that's yeah. clever. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why they did that. Uh, it. Uh, it I, I don't know why they regulate. hadn't done it before. I guess is a better question. Why what did I you th- What did you think about that event? Now that you since you've done the event in South America, which I, I, the first time I went to the Dakar was in South America, and because it's different from when it was in Africa. In South America, almost everyone has a car. Yeah. So I thought, I'm going to go check out the Dakar. So I get this Defender 110 and I drive over from Santiago over the mountains and and I'm trying to get to the Dakar. I could not even get close. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. It, there were so many people, yeah. so many locals. If you were on a motorcycle, you'd be set. But yeah. in a car, forget. We couldn't get close. Traffic is crazy. So I turned around and I went to Mendoza and drank wine for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, it turned out track. just fine. <laughs> well, and watched, just the, fine. watched the Dakar from the helicopter. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. exactly. No, when, when it was in Peru in 19, when we went, uh, there were like 300,000 people at the start. They I mean, a- it was so packed that they were starting to have riots. Justin mm. and I, at separate occasions, were almost we were getting caught into riots. Mm. And like, it was so packed, people would hold their babies over their heads so they wouldn't get crushed wow. by the crowd. Yeah, it was completely... I, the, I actually insanity. escaped all of that courtesy of Max Eddy and Robbie Gordon. Robbie Gordon came out of nowhere, and everybody was like moving out of the way to get... A photo yeah, of him, and he and, caught eyes with Justin. Yeah, he's like, you and I was, he's like, "You want to come with us?" And I was like, <laughs> yes, "Yeah, please. help, get me out of here." Yeah, wow. and everybody just it was like parting the Red Sea because everybody was backing up to try and get a photo of him, mm-hmm. and that's it was like being us. at a soccer match and yeah. everybody's trying to crush each other. Yeah, and, yeah. it was yeah. nuts. Yeah. And then going from that to Saudi is, I mean, it's crickets. The yeah, I mean, obviously there, COVID's guys. going on, but yeah, the. There were hard, there's hardly anybody there. Am I the only one that thinks that sounds lovely? It's not bad. I mean, <laughs> it was pretty it was nice. Really honestly. Easy to walk around. Although yeah. we, we we went to the Silkway Rally in July of last, uh, and that's in Mongolia, Russia. It starts Russia. in Russia. It changes every year, okay. also. Um, it always but starts when in we Russia. We were there. Though. It was Russia through Mongolia to China. Okay. It was last year was supposed to be their 10th anniversary, so they were going to do something like France to mm. Moscow to China to Mongolia, all this crazy route, then maybe to a couple of the stands. This year, I'm not entirely sure what the route is, but... Yeah, we don't know yet. They yeah. haven't announced the route So, yet. So you guys have done Dakar in South America. You've, you've done Dakar in Saudi. Saudi, obviously, this year. You've done Silkway. Yeah. You've done... When you were the photographer for the Baja Rally for both of you for quite a while, for Sonora Rally. Yep. Um, I mean, that's we went to the Sardinia rally. That, that was, was how it was. Oh, I remember that. I was yeah. so yeah. jealous. Yeah. I was, was like, any any reason to go to Sardinia is yeah. a good reason. Yeah, yeah. the place. That was the last time I mean, you and you I hung out. Yeah, there. actually, yeah. yeah, the last time I was there was with you. Yeah, yeah. I was so that's jealous right. for the Gucci. Yeah, we were there for that TT eighty five launch, and yeah, then while everybody else was 
doing whatever they were doing. We grabbed like this three cylinder <laughs> rental car yeah. and drove around. It was perfect. It was, oh yeah, it was great. It was yeah. great. Yeah. yeah, went and found some ruins. Yeah, that was awesome. Just, that's oh, yeah. why like the small, more intimate races. I'm not gonna lie, they're the way more fun mm. than going to the Dakar. Dakar's just suffering. But if you want to experience a rally, like you go to the Sardinia rally, you go to Morocco, you do Greece, like go somewhere you want to experience the culture and yeah. And take a vacation like, and then go Dakar around. seems hard. Like Dakar seems hard as media, oh, uh, as yeah. you guys were there. Dakar seems hard on the cruise. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember watching uh, that, the, the, the vlog series that Lyndon Poskett did. Oh, yeah. Um, where he was in the, what was the name of the class? The Mali Moto. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this dude's like, has just ridden 12 or 14 hours on a motorcycle at race pace. And now he's sleeping next three feet from a generator. Yeah. And I'm like, nope. I'm not cut out for this. No, <laughs> no. Malimoto they're is the, definitely the, the that's yeah. that's like they're proper the Dakar. That's that's real Dakar. Yeah. The, that's what the original Dakar was kind of mm. framed around. It's like what you can fit in this box. You're completely unsupported. You take care of yourself. Mm. But then it was in Africa. So yeah. in in South America, I'm not going to say it was easier, but race friends of ours are like, eh, it's easier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. But it's still like uh, and. Back in Saudi, it's it's another new challenging terrain, and it's still very, very hard. It's, I'm, I'm amazed by the the variety of terrain that Saudi Arabia offers. I mean, I, I guess rather ignorantly, I've always thought KSA was desert. Sand, was sand was sand dunes. I thought yeah. it was. Yeah, it's what you saw. In, well, and, in I mean, the empty Lawrence quarter, the, the southern half is. Just yeah, sand. yeah, yeah. But, and then and then we have a mutual friend, Louis Ashelli, um, and. Uh, I know he's probably listening to this. I'm sorry if I butchered your your name, but um, the stuff he posts so, and the stuff that so you guys great. are posting, I mean, it's like, oh look, here's Moab, but it's twice the size and there's no one there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, it's. I mean, I've always heard that the Middle East has some incredible untouched yeah. landscape, and I've always been very curious. Yeah, and uh, rightfully so because Saudi had some of the most incredible, diverse, and just surprising landscape that you'd ever see um and and as a as a as a woman traveling there they've you know i think it's worthwhile prefacing that i personally feel saudi has made you know huge huge steps in um rights for women and uh modernization and things i mean you have to take into the contest that they really are making a lot of progress Um, comparatively there's probably things that still aren't right by western standards but uh, they're they're a different culture well we've yeah. talked about what we've her and i've talked about this and numerous people like you have to remember that this is a culture that's thousands of years old yeah and they've, and they've been, been doing this off yeah they've been closed off many years like so been, any any step is a big step for yeah. them and and the fact that they've you know the, the crown prince is he's got his project 2030 and he's trying to yeah. open the country up for tourism by 2030 and and treat it like another dubai another emirates you know yeah, yeah. effectively and for whatever the government's faults are the people there are still open to new ideas mm. and interested and like they were extremely curious about us while we were there um they were very supportive very giving i mm. mean their culture they're known for being great hosts yes um and so it's just it's something that if you don't go there and if you listen to what people tell you um you won't get the chance to experience how good those people are yeah, yeah. and how cool the culture is yeah. um and, you know, uh, as a woman, I'm sure we'll get into it. It's just like I was stressing over what I'm supposed to wear, what, how I'm supposed to act, especially my, you know, by myself because he and I will be separated. And at first I wore the abaya and I covered my hair and no one thought anything of it. And then slowly I just started to see where my limits were. And I never really – I was never bothered. So mm. no one seemed to care. They'd still, maybe it's because I was with a race team that they were maybe forgiving because yeah. they put like, for instance, their celebrities are in a different status. They might show up in without their hair covered and more scantily clad comparatively. But um, for me, I never felt like I was an outsider necessarily. Mm. They, yeah. People still talk to me. They still ask questions. They never looked me up and down as if I wasn't appropriate. I didn't that way yeah so yeah we met some we met some very interesting people like I, I was in the middle of the desert first or second stage 
ran into a, a guy named Nasser. He's a little bit younger than me. And he was wondering what I was doing in the middle of the desert. And I equally so. I'm like, what, how are you out here? And he's, uh, he's like a computer, you know, he works in IT in Riyadh. And we were on the opposite side of the country. And he had taken his two-week vacation from work to go chase the Dakar around all of Saudi. And he'd, awesome. never, he'd never seen most of his own country, just, you Amazing. know, naturally. And, and so he... And he loves cars. So he's like, this is perfect. Oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're car cars. crazy. Yeah. Yes. And he... Like he and I spent like two and a half, three hours in the desert together, just hanging out and talking. Me trying to get a better understanding of what being a thirty-something is like in Riyadh. And he, we, you know, we start chatting on social media and stuff throughout the race. He's sending me photos. He ended up coming back to Jeddah at the finish and meet us. He met us at our hotel and brought us like bags of dates and hung out and had oh, coffee. Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Street, like, right? that's amazing. He's really into RC cars and stuff. <laughs> oh, yes. And so are we. Right yeah, he's, yeah, he's a cool dude, he's like out of nowhere. And yeah. I mean, that's just the kind of stuff that. I mean, the whole happens. GCC is car crazy, right? Yes. So I think mm -hmm. as car and motorcycle people, there's just that instant connection. Yeah. Like yeah. every time I've been there, like I remember a oh man, it was probably seven or eight years ago, and I spoke at the Dubai Travelers Festival. I think you remember that. Yeah. And the people I met there were just like, just truthfully wonderful people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think like the crown prince lent us a bus from his camel racing club to, 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 to camel racing us around. Thing, man. I, yeah, camel it's a real racing, deal. If, if yeah. it wasn't for COVID, I would have been there for sure, front row. Well, oh, they had like those little, the yeah, little, little RC car guys and they like hit on their phones and it like, you know, like yeah. the little the little RC man hits the camel gently. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's crazy stuff. That's well, and, and for those that are listening, it's just so important as travelers that we are very, very careful about information about a country that comes from from mainstream news because that has they have an agenda of driving traffic and viewership and 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 uh scary things sell great yes. in that yes. space absolutely and then we need to be even more careful about getting advice about travel from someone who has not been there absolutely um in yes. fact it should be dismissed out of hand because all you're doing is you're getting all of that scary news stuff now filtered through their own cognitive biases. And then now they're telling you all the reasons why you're going to die because you go to yeah. Ensenada, exactly. which is, which is of course completely false. So if, if we're looking to get information about traveling to a place, get a hold of someone who's been there recently and someone who's a traveler, not a business person that just happens to go to the cities, go talk to somebody who's a traveler that loves travel that's been there recently and you're going to get all the great info. Yep. You're going to find out where the great restaurants are, the taxi guy who like totally hooked him up for the whole week and yep. took him to see his family. And, and those are the people you need to talk to. If we drive our decisions off of what we see from media, we'll be greatly misled. So yeah, it was uh, our, our friend, Austin Vince, there yes. was a statement he had made that you, you never listen to anyone who hasn't done exactly what you're planning to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unless they've done exactly what you're planning to, you know, set out to do. It's they a lot don't. of past, like, perpetuated misinformation. Sure. And it's unfortunate because so many great places are overlooked for people who maybe want to begin, you know, as a novice, begin traveling, begin seeing the world, and they start to trap themselves in these normal patterns of, of tourism because they don't, they're too scared to venture yeah. off, and they keep listening to people who've only gone to Sands in right. Cancun. <laughs> yeah, you know? totally. well, I mean, Sonora, Sonora, Mexico is a great example of that. Uh, it's, no doubt, it's untouched. No you know, doubt, you know? and I, I hate to tell people to go there because I want it to stay <laughs> yeah, untouched. Yeah, it's awful. But it's, I'll never go. It's, I mean, it really is an incredible place. And yeah, equally, equally so to to Baja in its own way, and and very different, very different than than the rest of Mexico. And it is a border, you know, and it is it is a border state and. You know, that comes with its own issues. Um, yeah, you just have to be careful. Yeah. yeah. Just, just have to be mindful. Don't go don't looking for trouble. Don't be a travel. target. Yeah. yeah. Don't yeah. ask for drugs in places. That's <laughs> yeah. number one. Yeah. Don't buy drugs in Tijuana. Yeah. yeah. That's buy how, them in Ensenada. I always tell people, yeah. like, <laughs> quit trying to buy weed. When, you know, you just don't, like, quit doing that. That's yeah, how buy you a bottle of wine already. Just like, or they have this little. great thing called tequila. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's yeah, you're right. That one little stretch of coast between... Rocky Point, Puerto Penasco, yep. and um, El Golfo de Santa Clara. Yeah. Yep. Like no one, no, well, they do now because yeah. we're, yeah, we're yeah. just telling yeah. a couple yeah. tens yeah. of thousands of people. But um, that, if you want to get away from the traffic of Baja coastline, um, that is a really neat spot. That's and cool. 
There's an easy road to get back to either city, but you can also drive along the coast and there's great camping. Yeah, El Golfo is a very cool. Yeah. It's scary. Don't go there. Don't steal yeah. my yeah. really beautiful, pristine beach spots. Don't go to <laughs> Hermosillo, which is a really progressive and cool town. Yeah, that's another yeah, great yeah, spot. Yeah, Hermosillo is very cool. They're very also, cool. Yeah, I mean, they're the Ensenada of Sonora, so they, yes. they've got the good food. They've got the, the youth that brings the art and brings the new cultures and brings the new ideas. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for, for where Mexico is going. I mean, I think the more you travel there, the more you start to see um, smaller houses turning into bigger houses, shacks turning into you yeah. know, developments. And um, maybe that wasn't the right way to say that, but there's progression, I guess. Yeah. And, and they're making a lot of stuff. They, well, they make a lot of, I mean, the way the United States was in the, you know, the 20s and 30s, we were producing and, and Mexico's producing. Yeah, they, they are. Can, well, and the internet you know, allows this accessibility as a, an entrepreneur, as an artist, as putting yourself out there. And, you know, our generations and uh, Gen X, we've really grasped the technology and, and made something mm -hmm. out of it. And Mexico is no different. Same, yeah. You know, the rest of the world, as long as they have the internet, they can do something. Yeah. They can multiply themselves. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> extend their audience very quickly. Yeah. Uh -huh. I guess along that line, um, Talk a little bit about what it is that you guys do. Like, what's the, like, what is the, the Rolodex of things that you guys do to make money to stay on the road? Oh, I mean, anything that someone will pay us for usually is a good start. Okay, let's, let's just stop there. <laughs> right. um, well, this is going out on the internet. <laughs> um. Well, I, I think on paper, we own a multimedia company and we create content for motorcycle industry, the motorsports industry, travel, travel. Um, we, you know, we do photo editorial, we, we shoot video. We, um, I mean, we'll do PR. your book layout. We'll help you with your website. We'll give you consultation on PR, social media, marketing. I mean, anything that requires imagination in a sense for branding, we try to help with. And I love and your branding stories. too. Like the the West by One Thousand logo is just perfect. So yeah, the so photography's great. great. The writing's yeah, that's, great. That's our buddy Asher. He he, oh, he, yeah, he, he really was adamant liked. on the fact that it needed to say nothing. Like a good a good logo shouldn't say anything. Yeah, yeah. I the, agree Nike, with that, the Nike personally. swoosh, you know. Yeah, for sure. You, you know exactly what it is. And you guys have done big social media management campaigns for recognizable brands like Touratech comes to mind. Yep. Yep. Uh, what are some of the other clients that you Back, guys have worked with? Backcountry discovery routes, Wolfman luggage, Butler, yeah. we still Butler, work Butler with maps. Now. Yeah. Um, Black dog. Uh, Black yeah. Gorks. Kurt and Black dog. Yeah. 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 yeah he's, he's speaking of Baja. He's somebody who's, he is, he's, he's down living there. down there. Yeah. He's yeah. down there half the time. It's, and we actually just started working with camel adventure, uh, which is, they're a really cool company. They've really broadened their horizons too. Since when we first met them and they were still camel tanks, Oh, and, cool. and they've been really expanding a lot on product, I believe. Yeah. yeah, and those tanks are great. Those are that's a great oh, way know. to add some range. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very clever design. Very cool design, actually. I really like it. Yeah, we've done a lot, a lot with uh, in the mo in, the, in the adventure motorcycle space in terms of social media management, mm -hmm. yeah, marketing and that sort of thing. That's yeah. that's They're been the a most welcoming to us. So we just we like to go smaller, you know, like a few small projects at a time. Yeah. To at least, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket, sort of thing. Yeah. And they don't ask too much of us. We don't ask too much of them. We all stay pretty fluid. Yeah. We've been doing a lot in the UTV space lately. Yeah. yeah. Just it's. I mean, it's it, it is what it is. Exploding. Blowing up. Exploding. Yeah. Yeah. exploding. And I. It's exploding our trails, but yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. a different. Discussion. But I mean, to be honest, like I've, you know, I I came into it. You know, they were golf carts as far as I was concerned, and powered by vacuums. And yeah. And uh, God, they sound so terrible. Like, so I, they're so depressing. If they can, ju if they can just, if they can just fix the sound. Oh, so I. That's all they, they got to do. Just, is they'll just have go a stereo electric. that plays V8 noises while they're driving. Yeah, they just got to uh, fix. All they got to do is fix the sound. I, I've, I was in the one that fixed it. I, I was yes. just in the the Yamaha 1000. I forget the, Iteration. the alpha numeric designation. You know, YZ XYR whatever. Um, our, I did. We're doing a story about it. A friend. Took a took the new Yamaha 1000. It's basically an R1 motor out of the, the motorcycle oh. with, a, with a big turbo. You've yeah. piqued my interest. Makes yeah. 100 with a turbo with a turbo. Makes makes between 165 and 235 horsepower depending on how much boost you run into it. Um, his iteration has, you know, he's he's got a bunch of suspension work and stuff mm -hmm. done, but it sounds insane. It's it has a sequential gearbox, so it's flappy paddles. 
wow. race car yeah. stuff. It's he's got and he put a skin on it that makes it look like a baby raptor. Yeah, it's got a, <laughs> a fiberglass. Fiber I've seen it with yeah. like the Volkswagens, and they put like little raptor. Yeah. So yeah, he uh, <laughs> sequential gearbox. It's he's got twenty five inches of travel at the rear, twenty three at the front. Um, we rallied that thing yesterday on Sunday, I guess. I mean, it's it's like a trophy truck. It's it literally acts and feels like a trophy truck. Wow, it's nuts. Yeah, we and want one so bad. Yeah, and that's the only first. It's the first one that I'm I've been fully convinced. I'm like I need I need something. Like Interesting. This in my life. He has some <laughs> some noises of it on his stories on Instagram. Cool, man. Just so in good. case you need a little taste. It's, it's, <laughs> it's so and good. where can we find you on Insta? Just my, my name, Justin, Justin. W. And that's not coffee. It's coffee with a Y. Yeah. C O F F E Y. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It was that thing's amazing. And I, I mean, nice. I've been in the, I've been in all of them now. The, the new Can Am Turbo, the Polaris, you know, big turbo stuff, and that Yamaha is pretty wild. But. But, but I still think that it, it really is an issue with the noise. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. And it, and if they don't, if as an industry they don't take the 13 year old petulance out of it. Yeah. They're going to lose the opportunity that's coming. Um, just make them quiet because like it, it's a big deal. Like yeah. people don't want them around their homes. Moab doesn't Moab just canceled rally in the rocks because the town quite literally said, we don't want you. In yeah. effect. Yeah. Um, and, and I think they just need to make them quiet. Um, like everything else needs to be quiet and is supposed to be quiet yeah. for, because it's not just about you. Yeah. There's like other people trying to live around you. Yeah. Stop being so selfish yeah. and make your thing quiet. Make it approachable. Yeah, make beautiful. it quiet. Make I'll, it quiet. I'll take, yeah. a, I'll take a contrary point of view in this. Make them not sound terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, Less vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like I don't really like hearing Harleys go by because they sound like, screaming, I don't know, like, they, they sound okay. like an internal look, look combustion look potato. Look at me. Yeah. Look at me. Um, but there are good engines. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Make oh, yeah. it sound good. Yeah, make it sound good. You guys mentioned you lived in Japan. Yes. Tell me about that. Yeah, that's wild. Yes. Well, we were lucky because, again, it was one of those opportunities that just came and, and was placed on our laps. A friend of ours and his wife, she's in the military or in the Air Force, and they moved to Japan recently at the time. This was, like, late 2014. Yeah. Um, and they had a nice big house on – Dakota Air Force Base and said, hey, anytime you want, come out, hang out for however however long you want. Mistake on their part, because we were there for like five, six months. Longer but, than that. I've made that mistake with travelers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come for Thanksgiving. Yeah. And, yeah. And then you kick yeah. them out in well, the he, New Year's. He, he was a friend of mine who, he was trying to be a filmmaker, and he was, he had met this group of motorcyclists, um, expat motorcyclists that were exploring abandoned Towns, villages. They're called haikios. Yeah, they're called uh, or yeah. Different Fasc yeah. fascinating stuff. Well, it's and the most ex most of that you can only get to on a motor. A lot of it you can only get to on a motorcycle, or it's it's much well, easier, you know, either on foot or on a, on a dual sport of some kind. Um, and so he wanted to film something about that and wanted us to come along. And so we did um, created some content for for that, and we ended up there a lot longer. We got lucky. The the um, security force commander for the Dakota Air Base was his neighbor. And, and a good friend. And a good friend. And so normally you're, you know, after 30 days, you got to take a hike. Sure. But he just would sign us in for another Every 30, 30 days. days. Yeah, and so that's great. He, uh, he's retired now, so I don't think he can get in trouble for that. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, I think that's a pretty, a pretty minor thing. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure. So, yeah, we ended up there a lot longer than we anticipated. Did a lot of cool stuff. Traveled from there to the Philippines. And, and when we went actually, to Sardinia, we were coming from Japan. Yeah. 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 Came back to the States. Once I believe you at least did. once I went back yeah. to the states um, for the Turtec rally actually, um, but yeah I mean we spent pretty much all of our time there riding riding motorcycles or surfing. It was we'd surf yeah, like we did actually do a lot of surfing. Surf like three days a week and then whoa and then ride our these dual sports around. We ended up I mean they have some really great waves especially because we like long boards. I'm still just I paddle around and then I paddle after something and then I it misses me and then he surfs though <laughs> and it's just. Like it's a bigger culture than we expected, and there's this like huge Americana motorcycle culture that oh, we yeah. didn't ex yeah. expect either. And yeah. Moon Eyes has a show there, like a big vintage chopper wow. show. It's a big, oh, yeah. big deal. Big. Stuff. They wear the. Did you guys see those like the the rad like '90s or '80s scooters that were like super crazy, or maybe oh, that was Bo Bo Yeah. Yes. 
There's plenty. A, yeah. I, I love Japan. Japan love actually Japan. scares me more than Saudi Arabia, though, because um, nothing is sized appropriately for me at six <laughs> yeah. three. I, Everything's going to cause you some kind of I, physical. I, I, I once, I once <laughs> was at like a udon noodle restaurant, and I stood up, and the chair went with me, and <laughs> and and then the chair fell over. And I'm pretty sure I offended someone's grandmother 14 <laughs> times because the restaurant, like, dead silent. Completely yeah. hushed. Stopped. Yes. Yeah. That is an interesting thing about their culture is that I actually felt more aware of myself in Japan because they have such strict cultural regulations for themselves. Like, yeah. Which is actually why we got away with so much because they think gaijins are dumb yeah. and don't, they're, we're just, animals so you know if they they we would go exploring around the mountains let's say there's like this closed down mine they put a sheet that says please don't go in here and no one from the country will go in there except for expats yeah. and they see it and they're like oh they just lift the sheet and go through <laughs> yeah in the u.s it'd be gated you know there'd be electric fence and yeah, you know sure. danger you're gonna die and get sued and all that and they're, yeah. they're literally just like a tarp like please don't go in here and they're like okay yeah we won't go in there and yeah. you know, we're like wait a minute <laughs> Yeah. What's behind the curtain? What's behind the curtain? <laughs> the curtain? Yeah. Just, we gotta, we gotta go in there. Built into our, <laughs> yeah. And they kind of forgive us for like anything that we do because they're just like, well, you guys don't know any better. It's okay. But they're <laughs> wonderful people. I think it's oh, it's one of the few places I've traveled where where people will actively come up to you and ask if you need help. Totally. Yeah, of course. Like I don't know how many times I've been on like you know a, a, a subway at Kyoto or Osaka or something, and I'm just like. Help. <laughs> Which, by the way, is the most confusing thing to I've, navigate. I've kind of figured out <laughs> Tokyo, but then I haven't. Like, I don't know how it works. I don't. Yeah. I Leaving think that, Tokyo is hard because you have to catch so many networks of trains. Yeah. Yes. It's and they're crazy. happening. Like, right. it's not like it's the one train that's coming in 15 minutes. It's the one train that's coming in 15 seconds. Yeah. You've got to. And you, you have to decision. be right on top yeah. of it. And they are super helpful. And I remember the first time I got on a train. Um, I came on with an elderly man and three or four young people stood up immediately to yes. offer him. That's what you're supposed to do. I still yeah. have my I think mom in my background. Like, like I'm, I'm afraid she's going to come out somewhere Whack. and smack yeah. me yeah. because yeah. If, if I don't get up. But yeah. Yeah. And you should. And, but it's beautiful that that is still part of their culture, that they, that they have such respect for the elderly. And because of that, the elderly live much longer. Yep. Yeah. They have much healthier lives for that longer period of time. They're much more engaged with the family. They're revered. Yeah. They're, um, you know, they're still intellectually challenged because their family comes to them with questions and engagement. Um, and I think that that's a really beautiful thing. So, yeah, I, I agree with that. My yeah. family's Filipino. They have a similar value. Nice. Yeah, maybe not as strict as <laughs> Japan's, but it's it's that like you take care of your own for as long as possible. Yeah, and you come together and. It's just, it's not necessarily that it's an obligation. Yes, maybe on paper it's an obligation, but it's like, it's an honor to be able to get to know those people as long as possible. And they have so much wisdom. They've, they've like made all of those stupid mistakes. Absolutely. If like, if we would yeah. talk to our elders a little more, we probably would have less suffering yeah. in the yeah. world. If we just asked them a couple of questions, they'd be like, oh, I remember in 1965, I did that thing. And mm. yeah, that was not such a good you know, program. So yep. yeah, I think that's really a beautiful part of Japan and, and how clean everything is. Mm -hmm. and, oh, I love that. Yeah. Clean that's clean bathrooms. My favorite. Yeah, yeah. Clean bathrooms and, and the food is actually super, super great. It's expensive, but yes. Although you can eat at seven. Yeah. You know and what? You can eat really well. See that survived off of seven yeah. 11 for the most part. Truck stops. Fantastic. Is that how you guys did oh, that? Yeah. Because I yeah. found that that Tokyo and Nagoya was like Oslo level prices prices. Yeah. yeah we were, so what was your tricks around that? A 7-Eleven, literally 7-Eleven has like insane. It's not food. like a 7-Eleven you'd see yeah, it's anywhere like else. US. You know, it's, especially in the countryside, you've got a lot of truck stops. You've got a lot of it's because their weekends are like, it's weekend. Let's go out to the country and oh, jam packed freeways. So the truck stops and 7-Eleven type places, they have high quality food. Like I literally mm -hmm. got, octopus and soybean salad at 7-Eleven. We had, they changed bows their kind of, sushi yeah, bows, things like that. They, in October, it's it's like a squid month, so everything <laughs> is dyed black, and yeah. it's, oh, 
Rice pucks. Oh, rice that. Pucks. Yeah, I mean, you could live on rice pucks. I mean, we were tra- we were traveling on bikes a lot. Triangle things. Yeah. yeah. Wrapped so in I, my... yeah, you you told me about those things, and yeah. I went to a Seven Eleven and I ate them, and they were bad even when I was drunk. <laughs> Yeah, you may have gotten the wrong. I mean, you have to find the one with the right picture. He's allergic to most fish, so he had to find the one that said chicken or like plum. I had the one with tuna, and it was like eating cat food with bad rice (laughs) mixed with seaweed. They have one that has baby eels in in the in the center, and that's that's a fun surprise (laughs) when you're not trying to buy the one with baby eels and you bite into it. You're like, my, my experience in Japan has has been that the food really wasn't that expensive, but maybe we were. I mean, I, like I've had very expensive meals there. Like if you try and go for proper sushi, it yeah. is. Um, yeah, it was expensive. Oh, yeah, it's really, yeah. really yeah. expensive. But you can you can have any meal you want for seven dollars yeah. American, roughly. I yeah. mean, if you're eating where, um, you know, kind of maybe where people do for lunch or, or whatnot. Um, they like, got lucky because oh, I'm sorry. No, no, they they like soft serve. And oh God, Kira loves yes. soft serve. So there's, <laughs> that what's that soft serve that's at Narita Airport? That's basically butter. Oh, you know yeah, what I'm talking yeah. about? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like even, yeah. so their vanilla it's, is not vanilla. It's like, um, it's milk. Yeah, it's like, like a milk. That's, milk that's the flavor they call it. Wow. So it's like really rich stuff. and thick. And that was like my main goal at any truck stop <laughs> was yeah. to get ice cream <laughs> as much as possible. <laughs> I still look for it everywhere I go. But Oh, that's <laughs> amazing. Now, so at the end, now how long were you in Japan total? Uh, well, it was over the course of nine months, and but we were gone we were in the Philippines, I think, for like a month during that. Okay. And then we were in Italy for a few weeks, or in Sardinia. And then I went back to the States for a few weeks. And, and didn't you guys have Ducatis in the Philippines? Uh, we had a, K- a KTM yeah. Duke 390. I remember that. Yes. And this weird 200cc Kawasaki that I've never seen before. The front end was not so Yeah, the head bolt was but loose. I and wrote it anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's made and then out. where, where in the Philippines were you guys? That particular time we were in... Oh, well, we're Palawan. Um, we ended up Palawan, on Palawan, yeah. and then we were also in Davao, Mindanao. Yeah, Mindanao. Yeah. I have family like in Luzon and Mindanao, and and a little bit of Cebu. So we just kind of hung around them, and then we went to Palawan because that's like that's like the locals' vacation mm. retreat. Mm. There's um, Boracay, which is like the travelers' retreat, but Palawans don't go there. Terrible. There we go. But it's like that's the local place. Well, El, El Nido's on the north end of Palawan, and that's kind of touristy, gringo stuff. But the rest of that that island is pretty undeveloped and that amazing. Sounds amazing. amazing. Yeah. yeah, like mangrove found, forests. And, like literally, the what could be defined as paradise is actually out a, a boat ride outside of El Nido. And thankfully, I don't remember the name, so I won't tell anybody. <laughs> It's well, describe perfect. what paradise was. Oh, like, what what about it made it paradise? I mean, well, one, you there's no way in, so it's on a peninsula, but the peninsula is so thick with jungle, there's no roadways. Okay. And so you have to boat, and you know this the typical like uh, sh- semi shallow to a, a, a shelf in the water. Everything's crystal blue, so you can scuba. You, they have kayak rentals. The place that we went is like a co- uh, like five cottage resort run by a family so you can't have a lot of people there mm. so the beach is really secluded um and it's built into like a, a mangrove so it's essentially like a giant tree that kind of blocks this boardwalk in the trees that you can walk through it's not expensive all things considered the fam the family feeds you every day yeah. we'll be sure to not put that in the show notes yeah. and selfishly go there ourselves <laughs> Absolutely. they have you, a little like a little share <laughs> bar shack that's like right on the ocean and the guy that the, like the son who runs the joint basically he comes down there and just like makes you rum and cokes yeah and you just tell him in an email like what you want to drink when you're there and he's like cool i'll just run to the store you know when we <laughs> go and do a trip to el nino grab groceries and come back Amazing. Yeah, and fantastic. how long did you guys stay there? I think like a week. Yeah. Oh wow. That was great. That sounds yeah, so we went, perfect. We went with her mom and her sister and her nephew, and we just it was basically us and then like an English couple, and we just hung out. Yeah. And then they switched out for another couple that didn't really care yeah. to be around us too, so it worked out perfect. great. That sounds so <laughs> perfect. Yeah. That sounds so perfect. Yeah. yeah we we were just in the Philippines. That was this. That last, yeah. we found that place the last time we were in the Philippines, but yeah. um, had we not. Where where else in your travels have you had that same sense of it being paradise? Is there anything else that comes to mind? <laughs> um, there's a there's a little hotel right in the center center of the Baja Peninsula, 
that has a has a little like a little bar in the middle of it, and the bar has like a really really terrible old pool table. Baja folks will know it's Catavina. It's, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, in, it's in Catavina, and it's it's an oasis. I mean, you, yeah. you you come in there, and it's like it looks like something out of bedrock. Like, yeah, it's really cool. It's incredible, it. and that, that area actually kind of looks like Prescott with all the decomposing yeah. granite boulders yeah. and, and yep. that kind of stuff. Or like 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 east of San Diego, like El Cajon, that area yep. where they're just yeah. all that stuff, and you. There's nothing there. There's not even gas. I think they've been. Is that new Pemex station finished? Allegedly, yes. Alleg- no. allegedly. It, 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 it was the last time we were. Okay. There, last time I was there, yeah. it was working. It was yeah. working. So that prior to that, it was. It made it even better that there was no gas station. It was yeah, just an old lady with gas cans. Yes. And, yep. But that that bar, we we always talk about that bar being like the like the cantina in Mos Eisley in Star Wars. Like, yeah. The only people there are travelers. No one lives. I mean, no one lives in the town. Even not like really. even even Danny, who runs the bar there. He lives 45 minutes away. Yeah. yeah. And so there's hardly anyone that lives there. And it's all travelers. And any given day that you're there, you'll meet, who, like, you never know what you're going to run you, into. You, you know what kind of place it is by the stickers that are around. Yeah. 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 Stickers. Yeah. And, you, and you, like, you end up, you know, like, blotto off of giant margaritas shooting yeah, pool with, like, travel. truck drivers. And it's just this... It has a very different sort of appeal than like a, like a pristine beach. In El Nico. Yeah. yeah, no, but it it's, sounds I mean, perfect. It's, people like that stuff. Yeah, yeah it sounds I mean, it's like when you're when you're on a dirt bike trip and you just want to go like sit by the pool. And I and, love like the courtyards on that hotel too, oh, yeah. like, where the rooms kind of face in. Yep. And, yeah, it's yeah, great. Very I love Spanish that. villa sort I love of that. Yeah. style. Have you guys done the uh, Mission Santa Maria just oh, out yeah. of Catavina? Oh yeah. yeah. You, you did that on dirt bikes. We yeah. actually did. The last time we were there was just this. December and we went with our friend Jaffe. We had done like a little off-road trip from Ensenada down, and it always to close off the day in San Quintin is we just go do a sunset ride on the beach, yeah. and just like go 15 miles one way, 15 miles the other way, <laughs> and then just like laugh and smile the whole time, take Instagram videos. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, just buy like beach trips in Baja on our on dual sports. We were the tide. The tide had just run out, so that the, the beach was like. Like look like glass, like wow. you're just running across glass was super good. Yeah, they, can't get can't go wrong with that. That's pretty good stuff too. But. Any other spots that come across your mind as those moments of paradise? It depends on your definition of paradise, right? Well, I'm but interested in yours because <laughs> like, so far it's pretty amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So far, I'm good with it. Like I'd say, if if you're more of a like a city dweller, Verona is one of my favorite places to mm. go. Like I base it off of where would we live. You know, mm-hmm. where would we be willing to stay for a long period of time, even if they're not really conducive to that? But um, Verona's a, it's an ancient town. It was where the, the what do you call that? The, the, col- the, Coliseum, the Coliseum in Verona is the, is the Coliseum. It was built before the Coliseum in Rome. And, and it wow. was the inspiration for was, the one yeah. in Rome. So it looks, wow. it's like a, just a smaller version. Yeah, and they're just, the, the old town is like closed off by a, a river, and it's really beautiful. The town's very livable very quiet but it has a lot of history and of course italian things food yeah. culture i heard the food's wine. bad there they it's have awful. bad wine the cars yeah. are yeah. really ugly never go super expensive it's also <laughs> 20 minutes from the dopest go-kart oh track my God. on earth <laughs> yes. it's an indoor outdoor two two level gas powered go-kart what? track and yeah. it has a one it's a two minute lap two it's got That's like pretty long. It's yes a, yeah and it yeah. has a like a mario kart style like uh, spiral, like spiral corkscrew, corkscrew yeah, coming corkscrew down from down. the top level <laughs> and actually, you're just sideways the whole way down the thing. That's amazing. It's, it's, it's <laughs> actually, there's a, a few Italian, um, uh, not Mario GP, why am I, so Formula One racers who go in and they just like they ham it up there. Yeah, just hang out. yeah. <laughs> there's a bar that like that faces the track. It. So when you're done, you can just knock out some cold beers. And... Or if you're Italian when you're not done. <laughs> 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 yeah. Our friend Manny Lucchese took us there a number of years ago for the first time and every time we're in Verona to hang out with him, we have to go there and yeah. no one can beat him. He's the fastest he's dude. He's the slowest around. man on the road. And he's like, run Dakar a few times. Oh, yeah. Malimoto. Yeah. Malimoto, yeah. 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 yeah, and his goal was to just like crush Malimoto all the time and then become a water boy for one of the, the oh, teams. Yeah. yeah. but And he's extremely talented and like a very interesting person. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's the only person you should ever interview Oh, but, interesting. But he is also the slowest person on the road. Like he drives a. Well, last time we saw him, he had a big van, and he's 
you know, 10, 10 miles below the speed limit at, at any given time. And he's like, I don't want tickets, you know, come on. Well, but then did. you get him in a go-kart track on a dirt bike and he's, he's like bullish nuts. Like, any other opportunity. I mean, he's the fastest guy in most circumstances. Wow. Awesome. That's very cool. Yeah. Verona is a good, Verona is a good town. There's, I mean, yeah, there's plenty of places. Right? That's the problem. Is, it's a big world. Yeah. When yeah. we were talking earlier about like, what did you learn? About your travels, you know, now as a, tra a consistent traveler, it's that one, there are too many wonderful places. So you just got to like figure out what it is you need and find the place that suits that because every place yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But we've also learned that toilets are amazing. They're an incredible <laughs> invention. Like yeah. when you spend... When you spend a bunch of time oh, in, in a country that doesn't yeah. have them. Squat toilets. Or yeah. just has Squat toilets or has are nothing. an amazing adventure. Yeah. You know, it has not. I thought squat toilets were the worst until I went to northern China and Mongolia. And then apparently cement hole in the ground is worse. Yeah. yeah. In there. Yeah. It sucks. Yeah. It's, I know. I'd just rather go outside. I really appreciate a, a flushing toilet. Now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's something you just, yeah. you know, yeah. it's hard to. And on that to, bombshell. <laughs> 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 well, what do you guys have coming up? Next, now that things are starting to open up, what are your big plans for the next year or so? Are you doing that that the new build? Yeah, yes. bike. We got a Royal Enfield INT six fifty. We're gonna build a scrambler out yes. of that thing. Fun. That um, one's yeah, that one's coming along. Um, that was probably the bike that we had because they were gonna take it down to Phoenix to give it to somebody. Sure. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that yeah. might be us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's only does it every once in a while not start. Yes, it's, it's a Royal yeah, no, it's, no mean, it's like every once in a while the starter button doesn't work. Yeah, yeah it's no, probably that's, the same That's bike. it. And then <laughs> sometimes the, the, the gas gauge is like you're full, and then yeah. it's like, well, yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> but hey, for for the price tag, oh, it's it's, it's such, a, such a great oh, yeah. bike. Oh, yeah. It's such fun. a great bike. Yeah, we have the Sonora Rally in May. That they they moved the dates. It would have been in April. Now it's in May, yeah, or no, it would have been in March. Sorry, and they moved that to May. We're going to Baja in a week. We'll be there for until we don't feel like being. Um, and then we're like trying to develop some top secret routes, which probably everyone know about with our friend who has a tour company out there and trying to do some ADV stuff. Nice. Do some whatever. He's going to walk across Baja. So he asked if we wanted to do that. So mm. we'll see. Um, so, so our rally may, and then end of June, we go to uh, Russia for the oh, Silkway. Oh, for the Silkway. So they're, then, they're, what I do know is that they're starting in Southern Russia, actually, well, South East, southwestern Russia this year. Last year... Which it, side of the Urals are they going to start? I, I can't remember the name of the town. Last year we were in Irkutsk yeah, sure. in yeah. southern Siberia and we yeah, went sure. from Irkutsk... Just we, straight down. Like We went around Lake Baikal and then we came down when... Yeah, Baikal's great. Yeah, it's amazing. It's we, a yeah. fantastic place. They Actually, the Silkway does a really good job about like showing their media the culture and, and yeah. the good time uh, because we got all a big taste of that. Yeah. And, um, I guess after that... We're still not like 100% confirmed, but there's uh, an event called the um, Mongolia Monkey Run. It's it's one of many things that are put on by the adventurists. Oh, yeah, yeah. the adventurists. Yeah. And so that's a pretty fun group. They yeah, are they, super fun. Yeah, they want us to come and ride these 50cc monkeys across I saw, Mongolia. I saw it. Yes. I saw the advertisement. <laughs> that is, that is the, the, the last thing. That I would like to do. I would yeah, kill no, to see you on a 50 cc monkey. Oh God, like I don't like know it. if my arms would go down far enough to like even touch the handlebars. I think you so. would just walk with it. Like you just throttle yeah. and then it moves and you move. The, the, kind the of problem the is that my spine would be the suspension. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's Absolutely. that's the deal. Yeah. That's well, and the deal. then when it floods in Mongolia, pretty much your your bike disappears. So. Can yeah. I just put it on a small backpack? Yeah, I mean you'd yeah, probably, you'd probably yeah. be better off. And yeah. I, I know some people did one of their monkey bike. Adventures in in, in uh, it was in Morocco. Yeah. Oh, that, yes. and they said it was lovely. Yes. Yeah. I want to go. I would not think it was lovely. <laughs> yeah. No, maybe not for you. You know, I think it's it's the fact that they do something so ridiculous that it gives you permission to do something yes. so ridiculous. Yeah. 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 And like, that, like, that part totally of it. Understand. I love that. that part of it. I like. I just want to do the ridiculous thing. On a bigger bike. <laughs> Yeah, uh, they had a, a rickshaw one. On yeah. a KTM 950. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it was like I don't know if it was Hong Kong or part of China, and they had like a race on rickshaws. And I was like, that sounds dope, except yeah. it sucks for the guy who's pulling you in a rickshaw. Oh, the, rickshaw <laughs> the, the rickshaw run they did, yeah, it was in India. Oh yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. Yeah. See, I would do that. Yeah. Because at least then I'm sitting down, and again, <laughs> spine well, and then someone else is doing all the running part. 
Well, no, they have they have little motors. Yeah, it's got the. Little, oh yeah, yeah. It's like it's the kind of like the yeah the trikes. Yeah, they kind of bolt. Uh, yeah, like a cabin on the back of a mo- of yeah. a one twenty five cc motorcycle. Yeah, I was exactly. thinking full traditional. I think like, the last carried by. Yeah. Oh yeah, that'd be cool. Powered. That, that would be cool for about a hundred like, meters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah like, no one yeah. would enjoy it. Right? <laughs> no, I think the monkey thing is in August, and then we. Then yeah, we... Mongolia is great. It's yeah. it's yeah, that that like northern it. route was one of the most memorable, special routes that I've ever done. Coming in from Russia, yeah. in the northwestern part of Mongolia, and then running across the whole northern, yeah, it's such northern an steeps. Country. Yeah, no, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it is an amazing place. I mean, like. Talking about going to, from Saudi Arabia, where things seem really untouched, they're also a, nom- a nomadic country. So it's like if you go to Mongolia, the landscape you see is virgin territory. Yeah. You know, nobody is built on it. It's and it looks like what it did thousands and thousands of years ago. So it's, yeah, and, if, it's and when they and when I'm they in. move with their livestock, they 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 pick up their gur, and yep. within a few months, it's all green grass under yeah. the gur again. They've not like laid concrete or dug some giant hole it literally just goes away yeah, yeah it's, it's like it really beautiful happen. yeah, it's, yeah it's beautiful actually 10 years ago if you'd have told me that i've been to mongolia three times i never would have wow you know it's like i never would have thought that would happen in my life i, I didn't not that i didn't want to go i just didn't know it's you know those those sorts of things just when they well there's so many countries in the world to see yeah, yeah. yeah. especially when you don't know anyone who's been to some of these it was yeah. kind of like the conversation earlier how do you know what to expect or yeah. what to want to go if I was to ask you guys, uh, and maybe you can both answer in your own way, but for those that are listening that are, they're, they're hearing your story and your life genuinely sounds fantastical, not only to me, and it's because you guys have made decisions to live your life a different way. What kind of advice would you give to someone who maybe wanted to start from the place that you did at point A? Uh, what kind of advice would you give them to get started or just to give them some encouragement, whatever that might be? I'm like, I'm so. I'm, I'm, I'm a so bit of a fatalist. So I usually, you know, like, you're not going to live as long as you think you are. Yeah. You're probably going to live a lot. You're probably going to die a lot sooner than you think. And yeah. you should get to it because it's just, there's too many opportunities for bad things to happen. Um, being stagnant and sitting yeah. around and doing nothing. I just, you know, my. Uh, my, my my father's nightmare is to die on the toilet. So yeah, sure. <laughs> he, he he kind of imparted that on me, and I just you know it's like you got to just go go do it. Say yes. Try you know, get after it, and be willing to give up a lot. I yeah. Mean, yeah. We, she, well, and that was part of it. It's like if you just if you wait until you have all the gear and the right things to be able to go, you'll never go. So just yeah. get the thing you can afford, pick a place, and go for it because it's not going to be the last place you go. Especially yeah. once you decide to do that. So pick one place that's approachable, something that you can afford, yeah. go to it, and then build your way up to the next place. Yeah. I think having like having your sights set on stuff really helps motivate. Yeah. You know, if you just buy the plane ticket, don't don't worry about the hotel or how you're gonna get there or what you're gonna do when you're there. Just buy a plane ticket, get that moving, and then yeah. or yeah. And marry rich or just prepare to be poor <laughs> a lot. Like <laughs> No, you know, we have a lot of, we're rich with experiences, but we definitely, our money, when we're traveling a lot, it just, we dedicate what money goes into there and yeah. we expect to spend it. And we don't cry if we spend it or overspend yeah. because it's, it's part That's of what, what you, happens. And, and you I, think, it out I think that you guys have done a, a really good job. You haven't emphasized the vehicle too much. Like you're, you're not, we haven't even talked about it really. Yeah. I mean, podcast, yeah. like you guys are about to travel and, and I think you know, I know like a while ago for me, like I just, I just went like, okay, go to Vietnam and rent a scooter. Like you yeah. don't, you don't have to like save up to buy the GS, nope. to buy the, the right $2,000 jacket, to buy the, you know, panniers and this and this and this. I think what's inspirational to me about you guys is you just went and you just did yeah. it. And you, you found adventures that, um, that you could do at the time with, what you had with what fit into your schedule. And you, like you said, you, you just didn't say no. Yeah. Um, and I think some, I think Overland travelers, I mean, how do you say it? Like they, they get a little bit too tied up with the vehicle sometimes. Absolutely. Um, and maybe that's cause it's part of the passion. Yeah. You know? yeah. It I is totally exciting. For sure. Yes. That. Yeah. 
Um, but and, not everybody, not everybody, but it's expensive, I oh, guess yeah. is what I'm trying it's, to get at, yeah, right? It's, it's expensive to get tied up with the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you just think more as a traveler and less as a enthusiast of particular motorcycle. Yeah. 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 No, I, so. I, we know a lot of folks who, you know, they're building out vans and four by four. And my father's a great example. You know, he's, he's got this, you know, this bitchin' four wheel drive quickly van on 35s and, but he's always he's always wanting to do more to it instead of just use do it. Something. Just go. Just go do, yeah. Like yeah. the van's fine. It's got a bed built into the back. It's yeah. got a fresh motor. Like off you go. Man. Yeah. If yeah. you look inside our van, it's funny because we, you know, for a little while we were known for this like van life sort of thing. Because we just before it was cool, and before then it, it became too life. mainstream for West by One Thousand. <laughs> and then, and then well, I wrote a I wrote a piece for for Expedition Portal yeah. about the realities of it. And yeah. The idea well, and that having a is like. Once you quit, once you quit moving, you're just you're homeless, homeless, living in a van. <laughs> well, and the thing is, so ours, if you open ours up, it's like it was never visually stimulating for people who like gear and, and building things out because it's literally just got like it's a, a cargo van. Yeah, yeah, it's a with cargo reflectics. van. It looks like you're inside of a baked potato. And then, <laughs> I mean, we didn't get foam for the the what do you call that the plywood bed platform thing that we have for like four years. We just slept on deflating mattresses <laughs> for a while. <clears throat> and, and you guys have been to paradise because of that. And that's the difference yeah. is that you guys have made a decision for those experiences to be a priority. It's interesting thinking about what you said, Justin, around life being short. I think also one thing that I've recognized is that the world is nowhere near as dangerous as we're programmed to think that it is. I mean, 2000 years ago, the world was extremely dangerous and we still have that genetic makeup where we're, we're constantly pessimistic about our prospects of surviving to tomorrow. Yeah. <clears throat> the reality is, is that the world now is very safe and you have to work really hard to actually make it unsafe. Yeah. You got to go um, looking for the trouble. You have to really go looking for the trouble. So if we can just for a moment recalibrate our mind to realize that to your point, Kira, like if it doesn't work out, you just pivot a little bit. You change your plan. Maybe you go someplace else. Maybe you come back and work for a while to make some more money. The consequences of starvation really yeah. aren't yeah. a thing yeah, anymore. You'll <laughs> yeah, you'll <laughs> eat fine. or you'll be able to find medical care. Something will, yeah. will work out because the world is a lot safer place now. Uh, that's really interesting that you say that. And it's been certainly on my mind too. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we can't thank you too enough for being on the podcast yeah, and thank you for, for sharing, thank you so much. sharing your experiences. Do you have any more questions for them? Yeah. When are we going to go drink beer? <laughs> you're, oh I think you're already, you're not already drinking beer. Oh no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm drinking fizzy water. I'm drinking fizzy water. Fizzy water. Yeah. Fizzy water. <laughs> Although I think the last time I saw you, we were very drunk at Dirty Dicks in Paris. In Paris. Oh, oh, yes. Drinking tiki oh, drinks. We I mean, I don't know if this indeed. story is appropriate for it, but we went back there and Justin had a wild time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I just remember walking in and you like handed me this drink that was on fire. Yeah. It yeah. was yeah. on fire. It's like, okay, for those who don't know what we're talking about, Dirty Dicks is like this epic tiki bar in the wall tiki bar in the middle in Paris. of Paris. Yeah, it's incredible. And it's across the street from like a divey, scary Russian Nightclub. dance bar <laughs> um, where Justin accidentally almost maybe got drugged and then uh, turned into a Russian prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. I yeah. remember that. Yeah. I was, I was still inebriated at 4 PM the following day. Oh, yeah. He had to have oh. me sing him to sleep. That is not a thing we do. <laughs> yeah. I was, it was not good. Uh, I had my stepfather had to rescue me. I, yeah. Ooh, and man. then they still were like, oh, yeah, should we there. stop for yeah, beer? They were there. Yeah. 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 yeah, and then we grabbed beers on the way back. And then what was that little cafe that we went to that was owned by your friends? Oh, oh they closed. Yeah, they closed, closed that place. It was right by Garden Orn, right by the train yeah, yeah, station. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They, yeah, they, and that was perfect. I wish that there was. It was a sustainable thing because it was yeah. just not the walking traffic didn't work out. But yeah, yeah. yeah it's a great place. Anyway. Well, that's a great yeah. story. Well, and another segue into Paradise Found in remote places. Never know. Exactly. <laughs> and Russian bars in downtown Paris. Yeah, don't do Just that. Just say no. <laughs> don't, don't do it. <laughs> well, thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you next time.